you for every single good gift that we have. From the rain we received these last few days, the sun that's shining, from the beautiful sky, every single gift comes from your good, good hand. Thank you, Father, for opening our eyes that we can see even today, on the 4th of July, as we celebrate uh, the grace that you've poured over us and, and given us life in this wonderful country. We pray that you would give us eyes to see even more goodness that you're pouring over us and that we would shine forth your light to this world. Be pleased in all that we do this morning. Pour your spirit and work in us this morning that we would draw near to you and that we would also draw near to one another in love. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So it's good morning. It's good to have everyone here. This morning, uh, we are having uh, our very own, where, where, where is he? Where did he go? Harold, there he is. He was there, and then, it's because you guys are twins, right? And I always confuse you two with, that's right, so our very own Harold is going to be uh, preaching this morning for us uh, on God's grace and his goodness towards us in allowing us to live where we live. And next week, we will continue our series going through the Psalms on the broken signposts. Next Sunday will be justice and freedom, and we'll be walking through Psalm 23, how the Good Shepherd provides true justice and true freedom. So I hope you can join us then as well. Uh, a few announcements are today. Uh, you may be reminded that we're having a little picnic lunch afterwards so that we can spend some time fellowshipping and cel celebrating the goodness of God towards us. If you brought lunch, Obviously, I hope you're staying, but if you didn't bring lunch, don't worry, we have some extra and we can share, all right? And we also have some watermelon. Please don't interrupt. We have watermelon, we have water bottles, we have iced tea, and we have even Twix candy bars. So you can eat, you can eat just that, you know? Um, so I hope you do stay. Now, a few things coming up that I want you to keep in mind. July 17th, we're having Jubilee Summerfest. I've gotten to share a little bit about how God's, God has orchestrated the events of just history to bring about this, this thing that's going to be happening July 17th in downtown Franklinton. We're going to be shutting down Mason Street and Front Street, which are right next to, to Main Street, and we're going to be putting on a celebration of God's goodness for us and celebrating the freedom that can only come through Jesus. So we, along with six other churches, are partnering together to celebrate Jesus in the middle of Franklin, in downtown Franklin, from 5 to 8.30. We'll be having hot dogs and burgers and free food. We'll have activities for children, activities for adults, big children, and live music. Each church is going to be uh, singing songs. And so we are actually partnering together with, with Franklin Baptist Church and with uh, Living Hope down the street. And we're going to be playing songs and singing songs together. So I hope you're able to join us that day. Invite your neighbors, invite your friends. Bring somebody who's lost. Tell them there's going to be free food and live music. All right, bring somebody. And also, if you're able, we need hands, right? And like I said, we're going to have children activities. Our church has been kind of responsible for heading up that branch of the, of the event. And so we'll be having face painting, balloon animals. Some of the other churches will be having little games for the children, giving away prizes. I want to thank all of you who did uh, volunteer to bring in prizes. We have a bucket full of chalk and jump ropes and bubbles that we will be able to use for the children in that day. So I want to thank you for that. And if you would like to donate more, or if you haven't gotten a chance yet, we're still uh, accepting some of that as well. And if you would like to volunteer, please let us know. There's a volunteer list in that room over there to the left. Uh, just sign your name there. Whether it's greeting, we need help. People standing at the beginning tent, just receiving people into the festival, giving them a ticket so they can get food. Whether it's at the children activities or helping with parking, or even at the prayer tent that we're going to have, we will have one or two representatives from each church in this prayer tent to give information to people who are wanting to inquire more about the churches. So please let us know. There's a place for you if you are willing to help. Um, now, other announcements is this Wednesday, we have Wednesday night service. As of right now, we're only doing it every other week. So this week, we will be having Wednesday night service at 7 o'clock. And July 12th, next Monday, will be deacons meeting. Now, another important thing is next Sunday, July 11th, is Sunday school. We're starting that back up. So next Sunday, Sunday school, 10 a.m., we're going to start back up. 
Uh, we will, for right now, we'll have an adult class and we'll have a children's class and we'll take it from there and see how that works and we might end up needing more classes. But join us, 10 o'clock next week. And besides that, in September, ladies, the women in God's service will start meeting again and so will the men. Men, first Saturday of the month, women, second Saturday of the month. Come together to pray, to fellowship, to look for opportunities to serve. Um, any other announcements that I may have missed? You may, th may be like, man, I can't remember all that. Well, that's why you have this little thing here right in front of you. So keep track of that, all right, uh, and, and be in prayer for these events that are happening. If no other announcements, I want to call Chris up. He's going to share with us a little bit of information about the country we are praying for today. Uh, Tunisia. Good morning. Um, so I was studying about the country of Tunisia. It's in northern Africa. It's the smallest country in northern Africa. And it's also the most prosperous one in northern Africa. It has a very interesting history as to how things came about as to where they are today. Uh, if you remember some of your secular history in school, you'll remember a general named Hannibal who harassed the Roman armies under the commander Caesar, who later became emperor. Hannibal was from Carthage, which is a major city in Tunisia. And as the time goes on and Christianity comes into the play and Christ is, uh, appears on the scene and is resurrected from the dead and the church spreads, it spreads throughout the Roman Empire and it happens to make itself all the way across northern Africa into Tunisia and other places. Uh, and I think it was 397 AD, there was a council in Carthage and that was where they solidified the current New Testament canon that we have today in our Bibles. Where several uh, folks there who were uh, uh, church leaders uh, in history, if you ever study church history, the uh, names uh, Tertullian and Cyprian might come to mind. Uh, two of the early church uh, martyrs, Perpetua and Felicity, were martyred there as well. So there's a great uh, history there of Christianity. But unfortunately, 300 years later, Muslim armies invaded that area and took over that area and basically brought Islam through force, through the, the sword, to that area, and it's been under uh, Muslim rule since that time. Uh, here recently, in 2011, that country became a place where we, uh, the Arab Spring, if you heard about that in a few years back, uh, where uh, younger groups of Arabs and Muslims wanted to have a more liberal uh, break away from traditional strict Islam. And the government in Tunisia was overthrown and replaced the dictatorship with a parliamentary presidential type of uh, government. And since that time, they've enacted religious freedoms in that country to where you can be whatever religion you want to be. You can't openly evangelize, but they're no longer legally persecuting Christians, and you can no longer legally persecute family members who leave Islam there. But uh, that doesn't stop the local folks from doing the same kind of things they got used to doing for many, many years. Um, the amount of Christians in Tunisia is about maybe less than 1% right now. And it's still a very hard thing for someone to come to Christ in the social community that they have. They're often ostracized and cut off from family members and still persecuted in local rural areas, even though it's now technically illegal by the government at the federal level for them to do that. So the things they want us to pray for, for believers in Tunisia, that they would be strengthened by God, that they would find other believers to fellowship with, especially in the rural areas, that they would also have uh, access to Bibles. It's not illegal to have a Bible, but there's no Christian bookstores there either. So many missionary groups are providing Bibles for them. You can actually legally bring Bibles into the country now. So that's a great plus to have right there. They also have an underground seminary that's been operating to train Christian leaders across the country uh, for, for many years and we continue to pray for that. So God's doing a mighty work there and we should pray that it will continue going on and that the believers there will be strong in the face of persecution and ostracizing from their families and communities and they would band together and, and, and be a bright shining light for those around them. And pray for also the folks that don't know Christ. There's a large group of them. Uh, when the Christian population is less than 1%, that means other 99 point whatever percent is not Christian, and they need Christ as well. So uh, pray for those who uh, don't know Christ, and those are the persecutors. Persecutors sometimes turn out to be the best followers of Christ once God gets a hold of them. You look at a guy named Saul of Tarsus, who later became the Apostle Paul, the most vigorous and most outspoken spokesperson for Christ we have in the New Testament. 
Let's go ahead and pray. Father, thank you for the believers in Tunisia. We pray for their strength, their unity. We pray, Father God, you provide for their needs, that you would give them the, the ability to stand for you, Father God, in the face of persecution and ostracization. We pray also for the, those who are not believers there, Father, even the persecutors, that you would change their hearts and minds and show them the true end of not following Christ. That without Christ, there's nothing good from you at all whatsoever, that all the goodness all the mercy, all the grace, all the forgiveness is found in Christ. Please help them to see that and want Jesus more than anything. Help your people to shine a bright light pointing to you and that nation, Father God. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. A video for them today? Okay. Into your hands we commit the people of Tunisia. Lord God, we are most grateful for them. We pray asking you to continuously guide and protect them. Father, Lord God, we pray that they may come to see your saving power in their lives. For many of them may be Muslims, but today cause a turnaround point where they shall come to see and realize your love for them. We pray asking you to let them share in your love, let them be partakers of your love so that they may not go back to their former religions. Father Lord God, we pray asking you that they may grow economically for your word says that you wish that we may prosper. Father Lord God, we know that poverty is not their portion and therefore we pray against it in the name of Jesus. We commit every disease on the land of Tunisia into your hands and ask that you Lord God shall free them from all poverty. You shall free them from all diseases. Father Lord God, we also pray, committing their leaders in your hands, that it is you that elects leaders. We also pray that you, God, shall direct them. Let them be able to take decisions in your light. Father Lord God, we pray that your love will forever remain with them. They shall never continue to sin and they shall be redeemed for you. We pray for the churches in Tunisia that they shall continue to grow in your love and in your unity. We pray for an expansion in the Christian churches too. We pray that there shall be more missionaries to do your work, to carry out your work in the land of Tunisia. We pray asking that the Holy Spirit shall always be with them in all that they do. As they move on in life, O oh God, they shall never forget you. We commit the youth into your hands, that they shall be able to remember you in their youthful days, so that they may be able to carry out the good works that you have planned for their lives. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Our dear gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you. Thank you so much for this country that you so blessed us with. And Lord, it's been an uphill battle for all of us. And Lord, as you have given everything to us, we praise you and we honor you, Lord. And Lord, we ask that you help us continue to fight the devil by going out, seeking the lost, and letting people know we're here to help. And through your name, Lord, that we can always do this. And Lord, we ask you that you also continue to bless Unity Baptist Church. Let us continue to go out and do your will, not ours, and bless us in the way you will. For Lord in heaven, we love you, we believe in you, and we have faith in you, Lord. I ask this in the loving name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.
Would you all stand with me as we read Psalm 117? Praise the Lord, Lord, all nations. Exalt him, all the peoples. For great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. If you would please stay standing as we sit, praise the Lord through the music. <laughs> Stand amazed in the presence. You ready? This morning's scripture reading is from Psalm 33. If you would like to join us in following along in your own Bibles, Psalm 33, or you may uh, just listen. Uh, Psalm is about halfway through your Bible, so just open it right in the middle. You should be somewhere around Psalm 100, maybe, and then make your way to 33. <clears throat> Psalm 33. 
Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright. All his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. By the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. He gathers the waters of the sea as he puts the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. The Lord brings the counsels of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people whom he has chosen as his heritage. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. Yes, he who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation. And by its great might, it cannot rescue Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him and on those who hope in his steadfast love so that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help. He is our shield because our hearts are glad in him because we trust in his holy name. So let, us, let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we wait for you. So let's one more time praise this wonderful God through music and praise his holy name. If you would join me as we sing one more song.
Sir. Call the uh, the children who are heading to nursery. Here, come here, Kurt. We're gonna pray for you first. Well, good morning. It's good to see all of you here this morning as we come to worship the Lord this morning. And uh, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, again, turn to Psalms 33. Uh, the pastor, he read uh, the whole complete chapter. I'm only going to take a few verses out of that chapter to, uh, to get my message across this morning. Today, as we come, we come celebrate July the 4th, the independence of the United States of America. Uh, today, 245 years ago, men, 56 men, godly men, they sat around a table and they had been talking about this for about two years. And then they uh, signed the Declaration of Independence. As they done that, they gave us the freedom from the British and King George that we could be a free nation. But today, as we come to worship today, is a day when our nation celebrates its birth, when we appreciate the qualities that have made America great. It's a unique uh, country that we live in. You won't find another country like our country. Beside the fireworks and the lakes and the cookouts, when most people have think of July the 4th, we see that one thing that is likely comes to mind is the freedom in Central. That we have the freedom that we can walk about and do good and do the things that we need to do. That we can share the gospel, we can preach the gospel, and just like we're going to do on the 17th of July downtown Franklin, that we can go out and tell people because we have that free speech. Freedom is what independence is all about. It's the freedom that we have in the country that we live in. What does it mean? What does it actually mean to be an American? Well, first of all, I believe that to be an American is that you're a free person. You've got a free will. You can do about what you want to do. To be American is to know a lot about the freedom. And we're surrounded by it. We're, we live in it. We talk about it. We hear about it and we appreciate it. And we have the uh, holiday of the 4th of July to celebrate it. But the freedom is a word that also should strike all of us from a different reason. And that reason is that we are Christians. As a whole, when you add that you got freedom, but then when you add Christian freedom with that is a whole different concept. The freedom is also something that is central to our faith. We have the freedom to share the gospel. We have the freedom to pray out loud. We have the freedom to go in the neighborhoods and talk with people and about the freedom that we have today. This morning, I just want to speak to you just a few minutes on God's God bless America, the land that I love. Or God shed his grace on thee. 
We're going to see this morning that after 245 years of independence from the British rule, we come to a country not for freedom of speech. We, we, we wanted in our independence as free to worship God without interruption from our government. We are very blessed to live in a country that we still, even in the midst of everything we went in 2020, of all the ungodliness you see on TV today, out in our streets and riding and all these things, even in the midst of all of this, we still one nation under God. God is still on the throne. God has not finished with the United States of America. God is with us every step of the way. So we have the freedom not because of the wars or not because of the Declaration Independent. That's very important that we had the Declaration Independent, that we signed it, that we become a free nation and that we have that freedom. But because we serve a God, we serve a God that has shed his grace on this nation this morning. I want to see today that we are free of God's grace. We're free of God's grace. That's the reason why we're here this morning. This is why that you were able to wake up in a free land this morning and come to this church where no one will harm you. That is through the grace of God and through the mercy of God that he's done this. So we see in our scripture this morning in the 33rd verse, 33rd uh, uh, book of Psalms. If you look with me down at the 12th verse. Because blessed is the nation who God is the Lord. People he has chosen as his own inheritance. The Lord looks from the heavens and he sees all the sons of men and from the places of his dwelling he looks and all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashioned their hearts individually. He consider all their works. No king is saved by multi multitude of an army. Mighty men are not delivered by great strength. A horse is vain hope for safety. Neither shall it deliver any its great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him and on those who hope in his mercy, who deliver thy souls from death and keep them alive and, and found them. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our helper, our shield, for our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Let, let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us just as we hope in you. And we have hope in Jesus Christ, in God today. We are blessed today to be called American. Our nation was founded on the principles of God's word. When we come, when they came over here and settled the colonies that we, they started out with, they came on God's word. That's what they wanted to do. And we were, we were a nation that said the Christian nation because of God's grace. If you look throughout the scripture today, you'll find out that the word grace is found in the Bible 159 times. Throughout the Bible, he talks about grace, grace, grace. The Old Testament, New Testament, he's, he means the same thing. Grace means that God unmerciful, unearning favor from God because of his grace was justified. His faith was justified in what he did today. God shed his grace, his unmerciful, unfavorable. On 245 years ago, he, men that sat around a table and they had contact with God and these godly men and they signed the Declaration of Independence. And it's still shared upon us today that grace is receiving from God what we don't deserve. We see that in Ephesians 2, 4, in the second chapter of Ephesians, the fourth verse through the ninth. But God, even today, is in verse 7. He says, In ages to come, He may show the ex exceeding riches of His grace and kindness towards us through Jesus Christ. We see that as much as we have sinned, much as we have rebelled, God still gives us grace every day in the United States of America. God's um, 
pardons us of our sins because of his grace. Even when we, we, had, uh, we uh, have a stiff neck, we don't want to listen to what God has to say. We maybe even get angry at God and things may happen in your life and you want to shake your fist at him. He, hear, he hears and he still forgives and gives us favor. We have a personal relationship with God. If you know him as your Lord and Savior, I hope you have a relationship with God this morning. Then he cries out for forgiveness. He hears and still forgives us and gives us favor. We have a personal relationship with God. He walks with us. He cares for us. He blesses us and God gave us a land which we call the United States of America. Rich land, full of goods, trees in abundance. I say that kind of loosely when I say trees in abundance because if they keep cutting down trees and building houses, we're not going to have trees. People continue to move into the area. We live in a land of flowing of milk and honey. A land that everyone deserves to come and make a go at it in their lives. Even today, just like back in the days of Nehemiah, our nation has rebelled and turned away from God. You can see it on the news every day. That's the reason I don't like to watch the news anymore. Because rebellion, they want to uh, rebel against God and the country and the founding fathers what they had found today. Uh, Nehemiah says, when you, they returned and cried out to him, you hear from heaven and delivered them. Today we live in a world, today we live in a world not much different than Noah. Over in the book of uh, Genesis, the sixth chapter, we see that the Lord saw the wickedness of all mankind. It was great in the earth, that every intent of the thought of his heart was only with evil contentions. We see in the sixth verse of the same chapter that God, the Lord said, was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved at his heart. Men rebelled against God. They continued to rebel against God and committing every kind of sin known to man today. But there's one man that was in, ver uh, in chapter 6, the ninth verse, who walked with God. We see that in Genesis. We know who this man is. It says in, in the eighth verse of the sixth chapter of Genesis, he said, And Noah found grace, favor in the eyes of of the Lord, God did not have to ha uh, did not have to do favor. He didn't have to have favor with us, but He did because He sent His only Son to take our place, to die on the cross, so that we could ask Him to come in our lives, and He would, and He did when I asked Him to come into my life. God does not have to have favor or grace on America. But he has. For 245 years, he's looked over with us and he walked with us. He's led this nation. This, this country we call America was found by men who favored with God. Grace, not because of anything they did, because just as Noah did, they walked with God. The things that we have today is because we are walking with God and doing what God wants us to do. God has shed his grace on America today because it was founded by men who did as Noah did walk with God. You're going to have to walk with God to have a relationship with God. He did not have to show his grace, but he did. We need to remember that the 4th of July as we come and celebrate today and all across the nation and today they will have uh, ceremonies about the 4th of July and tonight they will fire, uh, shoot fireworks and some people start a little bit early this week. I think they started about Friday night in my house up where I live at and uh, continued on to today and they really get loud tonight. You can't really talk about God's grace without talking about his mercy. We see if, if grace is receiving what we don't deserve, then what is mercy? What is mercy? We see that the word mercy is found 261 times throughout the Bible. God speaks about mercy. It literally means compassion. Compassion. 
or love that he has for us. He had compassion with us when he sent his son Jesus to die for our sins. He had love. The Bible tells us in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should never perish but have everlasting life. Mercy means compassion or having love. No man has ever given us compassion and love like God has. He gave his only son. Uh, mercy does not does not receive in what we do deserve. God is a merciful God. He has made a way through his son that we may know life and we have eternal life. His mercy is available today. As we come this morning and we have sung songs and we have prayed for nations and we prayed for uh, our sick but God had passion on us today. In Romans 6, 23, he said, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift, the gift, the mercy, the compassion of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. God's mercy is so great that Paul tells us in, in Romans 5, 8, While we yet we were sinners, Christ died for us. Daniel made a point to tell us in the 18th uh, verse of the ninth chapter of Daniel, we do not make a request of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. We are here because of his mercy. I've had people a lot of times want to know how far heaven is away or how far hell is away. And there's only one heartbeat. A lot of times I go to bed at night and I go to sleep. When I go to sleep, I go to sleep. One of my neighbors told me the other night that the fireworks kept them awake. I hadn't heard no fireworks. I was asleep. And only waiting to Lord to have mercy on me the next morning to open my eyes. And knowing that I have another day to live, to serve him, to worship him today. We see in Exodus 33 and 19, he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee and will be gracious to whom will be gracious and show mercy on whom I shall show mercy. We see that God did not have to show mercy on the United States. But we look at our current situation and rebel as a people that is just taking the law in their own hands. They deserve to be punished. And the Bible tells us about those type people. You and I are the remnants today, not because of we are here, who we are, not because we were born in America, not because we are American, but because of God's grace on us. His mercy on us. He saved us. Because he had compassion on us and his mercy are new every morning. Every morning when we wake up, he gives us another chance. You got a clean slate. When you, when you lay down at night and getting ready to go to bed and, and you pray and ask him to forgive your sins, you, you got a clean slate to start the new day. It's whatever you want to do with it. It's in your hands. As we celebrate Independence Day today, let us remember to thank God for his mercy. Thank God for the freedom we have, but thank God for his mercy, his compassion for this nation. Because he doesn't have to have compassion or mercy on us. I've heard people a lot of times tell me, he says, I think... How much longer can this go on? How much longer can we go through what we're done, doing? And God's in control. And it could be another 2,000 years before he send, sends his son back. We don't know. That's up to him. That's on his calendar. That's on his timetable, not ours. In the meantime, while we're serving God, we are going out sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are still a nation that God has chosen to show mercy this morning grace the question still comes to mind why why does he do does this i believe that paul tells us about it is chris mentioned it a while ago about saul saul persecuted christians and one day christ uh, god knocked him off his horse made him blind 
he came to know him, began to live for him. And it tells us that in the 12th verse of the first Timothy, the first chapter, he said, I give thanks to Christ our Lord who has strengthened me because he has considered me faithful. God wants us to be faithful to him. And Paul continues to remind the church that he was once a blasphemer, a persecutor. But then Paul tells the church in 1 Timothy, he says, but I receive mercy. Each and every one of you under the sound of my voice this morning that knows Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he had mercy on you because of the act of ignorance and unbelief. We also receive the same mercy that Paul is talking about. If we got what we deserve this morning, if we got what we actually need, uh, deserve, we would not be here this morning. The only reason we're here this morning is through the grace of God, through the mercies of God. He saved us. Jesus came in the world to save sinners. As we come this morning as a family, a lot of times that we come and worship God, everybody may not know that sitting in this room this morning may not know the relationship or have a relationship with God. He, you may never know, remember the time you asked God to come in your life and save your soul. Jesus came in the world to save sinners. All you have to do is ask him to come in your life and your heart and he will do so. A lot of times people believe that, no, I've done so much stuff bad, he wouldn't forgive me, he would. Even the thief on the cross, when he cried out to Jesus and Jesus was hanging on the middle cross, he said, remember me. And Jesus looked at the man and said, today, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. As we have come this morning, as we come this morning, we got a display down front. If you have a few minutes this morning as you leave the church, come down and look at this display because it tells its story. You got the Constitution of the United States showing that we're a free nation. You got the flag that flies every day. Not only our capital, our state buildings, our schools, and homes. You got a Bible which represents God's Word, a light upon our path that we can guide us. You got a candle that is burning, which is eternal flame that it would never go out. People don't realize how short life is today. We get up in the morning, we do our thing, go to bed, and you don't realize how short. But life is fragile. It's like a vapor. James tells us that life is like a vapor. It appears for a little time and then it vanishes away. And we are the same way. If we live to be 150 years old, then we faded away. You're going to be gone more than 150 years throughout all the eternity. You also see the cross on the pulpit. And you see on the podium, and you see that Jesus tells us as Christians that I sent my son to die on the cross for your sins. Now I want you to take up that cross and follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. And that's what he wants to do. As we come this morning, we celebrate. We celebrate this great country, but also we need to recognize God is over all. He's with all. And we need to remember that this morning. We should remember that we live in a nation that's free, that you can share the gospel, that you can go out and tell people. You can tell your neighbor that God loves them, God cares for them, and he loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son, nailed him to an old rugged cross, and he took him off the cross and put him in a barred tomb. And I can tell you this morning, as I stand here this morning, he's not in the tomb. Back a few months ago, we celebrated Easter and he, he rose from the dead. And he came back and he lived on this earth and he was ascended up into heaven. And today, he sits on the right hand side of the Father 
making intercessions for you and for me. Every time we sin, every time something's not going right, we have a spokesman, and that, that's Jesus Christ sitting on the right-hand side of the Father. He knows that we are saved. He knows that we have accepted Him as Lord and Savior. So as we go about the day and you celebrate eating hot dogs and hamburgers and cookouts and going to the beach and whatever you want to do, but remember, God shed His grace on us. He had the compassion. It's because of Him that we get the chance to do the things we're going to do today. So at this time, I'm going to ask uh, the pastor if they would come as we prepare for our invitation. If you don't know him this morning, the, uh, the altar, the front is open. You can come down and have prayer. If you want us, me to pray for, with you, I'll do that. But as they come and we do the invitation. <coughs> Thank you, Harold. Uh, Psalm 20, verse 7 reminds us, some trust in horses, some trust in chariots, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Stand with me if you're able to as we sing Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace. 